number 531. This is the best looking crowd I've seen in a long, long time. The numbers, uh, by best looking, I mean by numbers. Some of you don't look any better than before, but wow, it's really exciting to see uh, the numbers continue to grow. We say, I think we say that almost every week, and now we've almost run out of communion uh, this morning, and so it's a good, it's a good thing to enjoy. You know, we, we, it's good to, to, to be back together, no mask, uh, shaking hands, seeing smiles. Uh, we used to take that for granted, didn't we? And I think it'll probably be another six months before we take it for granted again, uh, just kind of how human nature is, but it sure is nice. While we are enjoying post-COVID life in this country, I just want to remind you it's not that way in much of the world still. And so keep them in your prayers. Uh, there are two or three countries where I'm supposed to have already been this year that are still shut down. Uh, in just the last two to three weeks, four countries that I work in, including Zimbabwe, have gone back on some kind of a lockdown or restriction or quarantine. And just this morning, got word that one of our teachers in Myanmar has died at 61 years old, from apparently from COVID. He used to just periodically send me things in the Facebook Messenger. And uh, to think that that won't happen again, it's kind of hard. So while we are enjoying this, just please remember to keep in prayer of all the millions, hundreds of millions of people who just don't have that luxury just yet. Been asked to deal with a few questions along the lines of what we would call doctrinal matters over the course of this year. Last time I answered the question, these are some of the questions that our friends are asking. The question was, aren't you all the ones that don't have music? Well, we dealt with, with uh, that question and answered it. Today we're going to ask, answer another question, but I have to say that, you know, some, some questions are, are loaded, right? I remember as a teenager, we enjoyed asking our friends, coming up with loaded questions. That's a question that if you try to answer it either with a yes or a no, it's going to sound really bad. You know, are you still gambling on dogfighting? If you say yes, well, that doesn't sound good. If you say no, that doesn't sound good either. It sounds like you were, right? 
Are you still mistreating your spouse? You know, these are, the, these are loaded questions. And if we attempt to answer a loaded question with a simple yes or a simple no, the, the answer won't really have been given in truth. Today we're going to answer another question that is asked, and, and it is, I have to say, we, we can't assume the worst of anybody who asked the question, but I've been asked this question many times, and I've never once felt like it was sincere. It's a legitimate question. It's a good question. It's a question that needs to be answered. So I haven't always felt like it was anything but sort of loaded. And we have to be careful that we don't try to attempt to answer some questions with simply a yes or a no, even though they are posed in a way that make that conducive. The question we're going to look at today is something that maybe your friends have asked you. Do y'all think you're the only ones going to heaven? Well, that's about as loaded as a question could get. Again, it's a good question, a valid question, a worthy question, but I would, I would encourage you to not try to answer that question with a yes or a no. In fact, I wouldn't even try to answer it without having a little bit of time to actually have a discussion about it. Now, when, when we have sensitive questions like this, and these are sensitive, anybody that can't understand that, I'm not sure... I'm not sure what they're missing. It's a sensitive question. Anytime we try to answer a, a sensitive question, there are, two, there are two extreme tendencies that tend to happen. There are those who are abrasive with the truth, and there are those who are evasive with the truth. Those who are abrasive with the truth, they just kind of want to win that argument. They just want to lay out point two, three, four, five, boom, I win, you lose. And they really don't care how it comes across. They don't care if, it, if it's perceived to be speaking the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15. They just want to get the truth told or get that person told. And so they're abrasive. They may know the truth, but they're abrasive with it. And then there are those on the other extreme that are evasive with the truth. This makes them uncomfortable. They don't want to really be in a position of possibly upsetting someone or making someone mad at them, and so they actually evade the question. They may know the truth, but they're evasive with it. Well, we, we don't ever want to be either of those, okay? And that's a challenge. We are to speak the truth, and we are to do it in love. Today, we're going to attempt to answer this question uh, and not be either abrasive or evasive. One of the challenges that happens, though, is sometimes we leave Scripture and we move to feelings and opinions. And sometimes our opinions are based on our feelings. Because I, I know many times I've been talking to someone, they say, but, but I just can't believe that God would really fill in the blank. Or, you know, I just don't see how it's really that important. Fill in the blank. And every one of those has this in common. It's prefaced with a personal pronoun. What I think, what I feel, what I believe. And it's a challenge to, to leave the feelings and opinions out of it when Scripture talks about it. There were these three men who had been very successful in life. And they wanted to do something, each wanted to do something good for their widowed elderly mother. But they also kind of tried to outdo each other. So the oldest son got, had his, his mother built a brand new house, big nice house. Not to be outdone, the second son had a, his mother bought her a brand new BMW with a driver. The third son knew how much his mother used to love to read the Bible, but her eyesight had gotten bad, and so he bought her a parrot that had been trained and memorized the entire Bible. All he had to do was tell the, the parrot a verse and it would quote the verse. It took 10 years to train it, cost $15,000, but his mother loved this. And so they all gave her the gifts. They were all together on Mother's Day. And the, the mother said to the oldest, said, Robert, that house is just too big. I live in only one room, but I have to clean the whole thing. And she said, Philip... I don't go anywhere. That car just sits in the driveway. But even worse, that driver just sits in the house. And I don't even like him. But then she said, but Joe, I'll tell you, that chicken was delicious. <laughs> well, 
sometimes we sacrifice the truth on the altar of feelings and opinions. And it's a challenge to keep those separated. So today, we're going to just make a few observations, a few uh, biblical points, each building on another, to help us answer the question. See, one of the problems with this question is it talks about, it, it really is trying to get to who isn't going to heaven. Today, what we want to talk about who is. Who is going to heaven? Maybe that's the best question we can ask. Let's make a few observations from the Bible. First of all, point number one, observation number one, fact number one, whatever you want to call it, is God has a special group of people that he calls his own. This is a biblical fact. Let me share with you just a couple of verses that talk about this. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14 says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself, notice, his own special people, zealous for good works. God has redeemed us, he says, to be his own special people. If you go back to the etymology of that word, it was a word that was also used to talk about the spoils of victory. If, uh, if an army went into victory and they were victorious and they brought the spoils of that land back out, there was a portion that was given to the king. He's the king. These are his. The king would have used the same word to refer to those special possessions that were his and his alone. God says, I have a special people and I have redeemed them, and I call them my own. You can almost see him beaming with pride. These are my people, and I call them my own. Another verse along those same lines, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. But you are a chosen generation. Now, if you are using the King James, it's a different word, right? It's a word I think resonated properly in 1611 when it was translated, but today not so much. You are a what kind of people? Peculiar. You ever complimented somebody by saying you're peculiar? Not so much probably. The better translation for our language and from the original is chosen. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, those peculiar people are his own special people. He says that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So point number one, God does have a special group of people that he calls his own. The second point, the second observation is that God has described this group in a variety of ways. All right, so he's already said, I have a special group of people. Who is this people. Who are they? Well, he has described them in a number of ways. By the way, if you are, you know, being able to have a camera on our phone is making us kind of lazy on taking notes. I love to see you taking notes, but if you want to, would prefer to take a picture of the, the screen, you can do that too. I'll try to let you know when I get to the bottom. Um, hey, I'm at the bottom of this one. If anybody wants to take a picture of this one, the, the second point is that God has described this group of people in a variety of ways. I'm going to give you those descriptions and verses, corresponding verses, and, um, and see what he says. This group of people is described as the kingdom of God. Matthew 6.33, you remember that, right? Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. Also, it is called the kingdom of Christ. He has taken us out of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of Christ. Also, this group of people is described as the church of God. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, and also the church of Christ, Romans 16, 16. This group of people is also described as the flock of Christ. John chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples there, and he says, I have others who are in my flock. And he was referring then to the Gentiles, for whom the gospel wasn't yet available, but would be soon. Also, it's called the body of Christ, the special group of people that he calls his own, referred to as the body of Christ, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 also called the bride of Christ, 
Ephesians 5, 22 through 32. And then just one more, just to show you this variety of ways in which he's described his own people. It's the family of God. This is the end of the slide if you want to take a picture. The family of God, 1 Timothy 3, 15. I want you to know how to behave in the family of God. By the way, you will notice that Church of Christ is not the only biblical description of his people. By the way, if you are a member of the Church of Christ, but you use Church of Christ in a denominational way, you're confusing people, okay? You don't mean to, I understand that. But, but Church of Christ is not a proper name, it's a description. It's the church that belongs to Christ. But sometimes I hear people say, well, I'm a Church of Christer. Or, you know, he was Church of Christ, too. And, and irony of all ironies, I've heard people say, yeah, Church of Christ, we don't believe in denominations. <laughs> and yet we just used it in a denominational sense. So just remember, it's not a proper name, but rather a description of this group of people that belongs to God. All right. The third observation we'd make this morning along these lines is that God has only one group that he calls his own. He has a special group of people, and even though they've been described in a variety of ways, that description still only refers to one special group of people. Now, you might describe your spouse in a variety of ways, but you still only have one spouse. There's only one that is yours. And so God only has one spouse. Let me show you again. If we can't make, if we can't back this up with Bible, it doesn't really mean much. So let's look and see what the Bible has to say. First of all, we will see in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11, this is one of the few that I'm going to stop and read, that only one was planned for. Ephesians 3, starting at verse 9, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which was from the beginning of the world, there's the planning, has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice that he says there was this plan all along to reveal the mystery of salvation and the plan all along was to do that through the church, singular. So only one church was planned for. Only one of this group of people that's his own. Also, also, we will see in Daniel 2 and verse 44 that only one was prophesied of. If you go back and read that verse, you'll find that prophecy by Daniel. And all of the words that refer to what's coming are in singular form. Also, only one was prepared for. In Matthew chapter 3 and uh, in verse 2, we find that as well, that only one was, was going to come. And this is John the baptizer saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Kingdom, singular. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Only one was prophesied for. Also, only one was promised. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus makes the promise. He hasn't, hadn't done it yet at this point. But he says, I'm going to build my church. Singular, again. He promised that he would do that. He did that. And yet, in that promise, there was only one. The promise was singular in nature. And then one more. This is the end of this slide. Only one was purchased. In the, the context of Acts chapter 20 and verse 28... We're looking at the elders of the church, and, and we're looking at some very important things going on in the, the early uh, history of the church. And he says there that, the, that those elders were appointed to look after the church over which, the church which was purchased by the blood of Christ. How many special groups of people did the blood of Christ purchase? Only one. We just don't know who they are yet, okay? We don't know who they are. We know he has one. We know they've been described in a variety of ways. We know by everything that's been said, there's only one. Consider also, and this is not on the screen, but Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. Paul lists seven important spiritual topics. 
entities. He talks about, let me just read that real quick. He said there is one body, spirit, hope, Lord, faith, baptism, and God. Now, is faith, baptism, spirit, hope, call, are those things important? Yes, absolutely important. And yet of every one of those, he says they are by nature singular. Actually, it's not surprising, is it? Truth is singular in nature. Now, when I was in school, I would rather that have not been the case. I can't tell you how many math problems I got wrong because apparently there's only one right answer. Did you ever suffer the same fate? There's only one group of people that God calls his own. Now, fourth, the fourth observation is that God has limited his spiritual blessings to these people. We still don't know who these people are yet, okay? But when we read through Scripture, it's obvious he has a group. And for this group that he calls his own, they are the ones that receive his spiritual blessings. God has always done that, though. Consider Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. And this is where Paul is talking about the, using this metaphor of husband and wife and Jesus and church. And there he says, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now you think about the relationship, and he used this relationship to help us understand the relationship between husband and wife. Where are the blessings of marriage to be confined to? In the marriage. Just as the blessings of Jesus are found between him and his bride. His blessings have always been limited to a certain people. First, Timothy, or first Peter chapter 2 and verse 10. The, the verse that we looked at earlier where he talks about those peculiar people, the people that are his own, the very next verse says about these same people, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. What happened? He said they weren't a people, but now they are. They did not have mercy, but now they do. What changed? They became part of God's special people, where all spiritual blessings are found. Now, we often hear, I, I just hope God's grace will cover it anyway. I just hope that, I just hope that somehow we'll get to heaven anyway, or they will, or, or whatever. But it's never been that way. It's, it's never been that way because God has always located his blessings. He always has. Uh, for example, you think about uh, Noah in the ark. Salvation in that day was very exclusive in that you had to be in the ark to be saved. But it was also very inclusive in the fact that anybody could get in the ark. Everybody had been warned about it. Everybody had been given an opportunity to get in the ark. But if you wanted to be saved from that flood, where did you need to be? There was only one place. It was in the ark. You might remember Naaman having leprosy in the Old Testament. And, uh, and he was told that if he would do two things, go and dip in the Jordan, it had to be the Jordan, and, and dip seven times, it had to be seven times, the, the leprosy would go away. And that's exactly what happened. But it was only because he was in the Jordan, and it was because he dipped the number of times he'd been told. But why? Because God has always limited his blessings to his people. He's always located those blessings for his people. It's always been that way. And so the spiritual blessings of God are only enjoyed by his people. Now, the physical blessings, we can't say that of, right? Everybody enjoys God's oxygen and water and food and beauty. 
That's always been the case too. But spiritually speaking, only those who are his people get to enjoy his blessings. Which leads us to the fifth observation, and that is that this special group of people that he says that he calls his own is not composed of all religious people. It's not. And here's where our feelings get touched, and here's where we don't like the truth. But it really is the case, and it always has been. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, now Jesus said this, not me. Jesus said, Matthew 7, starting in verse 21, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. You mean even those who, call, who say that Jesus is their Lord, and even not all of them will go to heaven. That's what he said. So who will? He who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. I guess it must be easier to profess than to obey. Verse 22, many, he said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and, and in your name cast out devils and in your name done many works? And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. We still don't know who these people are, and we still don't know who all is included, but we already know that it isn't just everybody who claims to be religious. It isn't even just everybody who claims to have Jesus as their Lord. Acts chapter 2 is also another interesting observation. Acts chapter 2, for the context, was the day of Pentecost. This was a Jewish holiday. And all the devout Jews who were able would go to Jerusalem at their own expense to observe this, this annual holiday. You could not get more devout religious people than the ones who were there on that day. I want you to think about it. If, if we said, all right, in, in, the, in the law of Christianity, once a year, you're going to have to make a week-long pilgrimage across the country you're going to have to do all of this at your own expense, and you're going to have to buy some animals when you get there to sacrifice, and you're going to have to do all of The ones that went, you would say, they're pretty serious about this. They're pretty devout. Well, that's who was present in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2. And yet, when Peter said, when Peter stood up and preached, and he said, you have killed the Son of God. What did they say? Ah, we're religious. Come on, Peter. I mean, cut us some slack. We mean well. No, he said, you need to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. Why? Because simply being religious does not put one in this special group of people that God calls his own. Another example is from the, the book of Acts chapter 10 verse 2. There was this man named Cornelius who I would venture to say was about as good a man as you could find. But something was missing. Something was missing. He wasn't yet, he did later become, but he wasn't yet a member of God's special group of people. Thanks be to the grace of God he could become one and he did. But here was a good man. I mean, he was a godly man and father, and, and he was the kind of guy you'd want to have as a neighbor. But he wasn't in that condition in verse 2, yet a member of God's special people. Again, this is sensitive. This is hard to deal with. So let me, uh, let me for sake of us understanding, use some more distant religious beliefs. For example, there are those who would say they are of the new age belief. Uh, they don't believe in the Bible. Instead, they um, believe in channelers. And channelers are those uh, individuals through whom disembodied spirits speak. So we don't have a Bible, but we have channelers, and we have these disembodied spirits speaking to us. Uh, they don't believe in the divinity of God, but they believe in the divinity of themselves. Now, they would say that they are devout and that they are in their own way religious. 
Can you believe those things and still be a part of God's special group of people? How about our Muslim friends? And I have Muslim friends. And they are good people. The ones I know are good people. Now, they, they believe in the Quran and not the Bible. They believe in Allah and not Jehovah. They believe in Muhammad and not Jesus. But they're religious. How many of you go five times a day to a specific place at a specific time and get on your knees and pray? But can you believe those things and still be a part of God's special people? What about our Jehovah's Witness friends? Good people, devout people. They are knocking doors when it's 97 degrees in August. But they don't believe that Jesus is God. They think he's sort of a hybrid angel that was created. They also deny the existence of hell. So my question is, can, can you believe those things or deny those things and still be a part of God's special people? Even though you're religious. Even though you're devout. You see... If being religious or being good is good enough, then I think I would argue for the salvation of everybody. Because how good is good enough? And, and, why, and I have friends. I have friends who are Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, atheist, and every one of them has a level of good in them. In fact, I would venture to say there are some people who don't believe in Jesus that are more good than some people I know who do believe in Jesus. But how good is good enough? I remember uh, I had a real eye opener. I, I'd always been taught, you know, Christianity has raised the level of morals around the world, and I, I believe that to some extent, but. In my mind, I thought that those who weren't had sort of different beliefs and it, and it kind of changed the way they treated each other and their level of goodness, if you will, until I went to Russia in 1993. You remember, the, the wall had only fallen a few years before. This is the people who had grown up atheist. Some of them had some idea there had to be a creator of some sort, but they didn't know anything about God. They didn't know anything about Jesus. And then I went into a store one day and I noticed that instead of, because the aisles are tight, instead of taking your baby stroller in the, stro in the store, everybody left their baby strollers with baby in them at the door and then went and did their shopping. Now I want to ask all you young mothers, how many of you go to Walmart and when you get in that little gap between the two doors, you know, by, just past the Coke machine but before the greeter, how many of you just park your little junior right there and then go shop? Oh, but we're a Christian nation. You see where I'm going? There is a level of goodness in all people everywhere. Religious people and not religious people. So if goodness is the requirement, how good is good enough? Do I just have to be a little more good than not good? If on the day that my life ends and, and it turns out, whew, I squeaked by 51% good, am I okay? I'm not being facetious. If we move to being religious and being good as the, as the, the requirement for who goes to heaven, you talk about unfair. Because God never told us how good we need to be. And I think that's unfair. If my eternal salvation is dependent on my goodness, he ought to at least tell me how good I need to be. Instead, what I read is, I'm not good enough, and I never will be good enough. How about you? So we know, as much as we want it to be something different, we know from the Word of God, this special group is not composed of all religious or even good people. 
Point number six, we can identify this group of people today. And here's the good news. We can, we can find out who they are. We, we know they're, they're there. He said, I have a special group of people. He's described them in different ways. The good news is we can discover who these people are. We can identify them today. If I said, I want you to find a man. His name is John Klein. He's six feet tall, weighs 170 pounds. He walks with a limp. His address is, and his social security number is, you, you'd be well on your way to finding Mr. Klein, right? Because I've given you all the descriptions of him. I've identified who he is. When you find a person that meets all of those qualifications, not just five out of seven or six out of ten, but all of them, that's the guy we're looking for, right? Well, God has done that for us. He's not only said, I have a special group of people where I place all my special spiritual blessings. I can, I'm going to tell you how you can find these people. And this is where we, we could spend a lot more time. Let me just make some suggestions. Apparently that, no, that clock is right. Think about who the founder is. We look at a lot of the churches today. If you go back into the history of them, the history doesn't go back far enough. It was founded by an individual or a movement or a theory or a, a special doctrine. There were some, some who would say, well, you Church of Christers, you were formed by Alexander Campbell. I would disagree. I would say the history goes back to A.D. 33 in the, in the day of Pentecost. What about the, the name? Is it a biblical name? We notice there's more than one biblical name, right? Is, does it at least bear a name that God uses to describe his people? How, do, how does this group of people worship compared to this group of people? How, how is it? Is it the same? What about entry? How do you become a part of this special group of people? Is it the same way that Peter told the people on the Pentecost? Or is it something else? See, we're trying to identify this special group of people. One more thing I would say to look for is the message. Are they teaching and preaching and living and espousing and proclaiming the same thing that we find in the Word of God? Those are some of the key characteristics to look for and to find this group of people. And the final point, and here's the good news. See, the, the question is phrased to for, sort of make us think in the negative, but here's the positive. You can be a member of that special group. You, every single person, can be a member of his special group. Acts chapter 2 and verse 30, verses 37 and 38, uh, they, they asked a question of Peter. What? which implies something, they, they understood, or at least they presumed something must be done, and Peter did not contradict them. What? Something must be done. Must, whatever this is, it's essential, it's not optional. I, it's personal. Whatever this is that he's going to tell me, it's something that is on me to do. Nobody else can do it for me. Do. There is going to be some action to be saved. What is it you're going to tell me to do that I need to do to that will lead to salvation that will allow me to be a member of his special group of people? Now, I want you to notice what Peter did not say. He answered them in verse 38. The question's in verse 37. The answer's in verse 38. He did not say nothing. What should we do to be saved? Nothing. Come on, you're already here. You're religious people. Uh, we already share some of the same beliefs. You don't need to do anything. He didn't say that. He didn't say, well, you don't need to do anything because I can see you already believe. This question implies belief, right? Hey, you don't need to do anything. You already, you already believe. Well, that wasn't what he said either. Instead, what he said was, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. He had a perfect opportunity to say you don't need to do anything else. But he didn't. And when they did that, the Bible tells us God added them to his church. I know sometimes we, we, we talk about joining a church. Well, truth is, God adds us 
to his church, his special group of people that he's described in a variety of ways where he's placed all of his spiritual blessings. He adds us to that church when we do what he tells us to do to be a member of his special family. Now that is incredibly exclusive. It is exclusive because not everybody is there. By the way, I know we are living in a, a culture that is trying to remove the lines and blur the lines. Just this past week, an NFL player announced that he's homosexual, and the very next day his jersey became the top-selling jersey. He was lauded as a hero. New Zealand has allowed now a man to be on the women's weightlifting team because he says that he feels like he's a woman. Sesame Street, just this week, introduced its first family with two dads. And just this week, a new one on me, the term gender fluid. For those who don't always feel like they're the same gender, they may feel like one gender one day and maybe another gender the next week, and so there's now a new term, gender fluid. Do you see what our culture is doing? is slowly lulling us into either the, if we can't remove the lines, we just blur the lines. But that doesn't mean the lines aren't still there, folks. It, yes, it's exclusive. But here's the good news. It could not be more inclusive than it already is. Do you know there are members of God's special people who used to deny he even exists? You see, if it's up to me, and you say bad things about me 30 years ago, and you say, I'm just not going to let you in my special group. But there are people, maybe even in this room, I know some. One is a NASA scientist. He literally is a rocket scientist. Has his PhD from MIT, used to say God doesn't exist. He now completely knows that God exists, and God allows him to be a member of his special group of people. Isn't that amazing? There are people who are included in this special group who used to be the worst sinners that you can imagine. They were scoundrels and, and hypocrites and, and you name it, fill in the blank. In fact, Paul talks about some of them, doesn't he, in 1, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Such of these things you were, but God has washed you. He's cleansed you. He has added you to this special group of people that he calls his own. Folks, you can't get more inclusive than that. Isn't that amazing? If it's up to me, you're not getting in my group. But thanks be to God, he's not like that. Because Jesus died. All of us who would repent of our sins and be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins can be added to his special group of people. That's the good news. Jeff Bezos is the wealthiest man in the world at the moment. Uh, his net worth is around 200 billion. That's with a B, 200 billion dollars. If word got out that tomorrow, tomorrow only, uh, June 28th, 24 hours is open, if you go to this specific website, and you register your name, address, and phone number, Jeff Bezos will send you $10,000. He's the founder of Amazon, by the way, and for some of you, that would just be a sort of a rebate for what you've spent on Amazon. <laughs> but he could do it, right? He could say, 24 hours only, I'm just feeling really generous, go to this website, moneygivewayfromjeff.com, name, address, phone number, you'll get $10,000. How many of you go to that website tomorrow? I'm there. I'm going to meet Clip. I want to get there before he does. And, and, and here's the thing. Nobody would say, you know, I just don't know why it has to be that website. I mean, what if I was typing and I meant well and I meant right, but I ended up at a different website? Doesn't, shouldn't that, I still get the money? Why does he need my phone number? You know, I just don't really think that has anything to do with me getting the, 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 the reward. I don't think it has anything. I don't know why he wants to know my, does, what is it, why does he want my phone number? I just don't think that ought to matter. 
Are you getting me? When it comes to the wealthiest man in the world giving us some free money, we will do exactly what he says and we won't question him. We'll just do it. And I would too. I'm right there with you. But the God of the universe says you don't deserve this. But I'll tell you what. I have made it possible for you to be a member of my special family. My special group of people where all of my spiritual blessings are. And I want you to do that. I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to everlasting salvation. That's what I want. It strikes me as presumptuous for us to question where God has placed his blessings when the truth is he doesn't owe us any of those blessings. You ever thought about that? Yes, there's only one way, but he doesn't owe us a single way. It's only through his grace and his mercy and his love that he has provided a way for us to come to him. And those who do that and faithfully live for him, and there are tens of millions around the world doing it, those are the ones who their obedient, through their obedience and their faithfulness are put into his special group of people. We'll never earn heaven. I've heard people say, you know, if I could just get in the back door somehow, I'd just ha be happy. To no. If you go, you're going in the front door. And if you go, it won't be because you deserved it. It will be because you are covered by the blood of Christ. That's the good news. And today, if you need to make your life right with God, we offer you that, offer, offer that opportunity and that invitation now. We would say to you what Peter said to those on Pentecost. If you want to be saved, repent of your sins and be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. And when you do that, he says, you'll receive the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Whatever we can do for you, if we can help you in any way this morning, please let us know right now while we stand and sing.
I just want to let you know that if you're interested in sharing these lessons, uh, if you will go to our YouTube channel, there is a playlist out there called Why We Do Some Things Differently. And I've taken the, the lesson that Brent did on baptism, the last lesson that Keith did on why we have, don't have music in the church. I've kind of condensed them down just to the lesson so it makes it easy to share. Uh, so if you go to our YouTube channel and you're looking for a playlist called Why We Do Some Things Differently, and it's also a lot easier to download something off of YouTube than it is off of Facebook. So I just want to let you know that. Let us all bow in prayer. Dear Lord, God, and Father, we thank you for allowing there to be a special people chosen by you. Lord God, we thank you for sending your Son to buy that special people. And Lord God, we thank you for all of the centuries and millennia of planning and preparing to make this special people come about. Lord, we pray that you can impress upon our minds, impress upon our hearts to make sure that we have chosen and taking the actions to become part of your special people. Lord, we pray that the worship that we have given is worthy and pleasing in your sight. And we pray that our worships will continue on as we exit this building and bring us back at the next appointed time. And it's this that we humbly pray through your son's name. Amen.